incredibly timely and important subject, uh, how we can put green jobs at the heart of the economic recovery from COVID. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Will Tanner. I am the director of Onward. Uh, and Onward is a relatively new uh, centre-right think tank um, set up in 2018 to level up opportunity uh, and strengthen communities all around the UK and particularly in those parts of the country where opportunity and community have perhaps been in decline for some time. Um, today's discussion combines two of the government's biggest challenges, uh, levelling up growth after the disruption of the last couple of years um, and delivering on our legislative moral, uh, political commitment to achieve net zero by 2050. Um, we should be no, in no doubt about the enormous scale of both of those challenges. They are um, probably bigger than, uh, than uh, any other challenge that, that governments uh, of recent stripes uh, have faced. Um, the UK is by most measures the most regionally unequal country uh, in the developed world. Um, net zero represents the complete transformation of the economy in the space of 29 years. Um, but Net Zero also represents, I think, an enormous opportunity um, to bring skilled jobs back to places where those jobs have been lost. Um, work by Onward for our Getting to Zero program has shown that uh, around 1.7 million jobs could be created if the UK um, hits the Climate Change Committee's balanced pathway uh, projections by 2030. Um, of those, around 1.3 million are in skilled technical occupations, and the vast majority are in uh, the very places that the government is looking uh, to level up uh, the North and the Midlands especially. Um, but there is a big skills and labour market uh, challenge as well. The regions with the widest skills gaps tend to be those with the greatest exposure to disruption from decarbonisation. Um, so there is both great opportunity but also barriers along the way. And so today we are going to get into some of those questions um, and we're going to discuss how to marry up recovery with decarbonisation, bringing green jobs to places that need them and ensuring the green industries have the skills they need to grow and meet the climate challenge. And we have a fantastic panel to help us do that. Uh, I'm thrilled uh, to have um, the people uh, around me on this panel. I'm also um, pleased that um, Ben Hutchin uh, agreed to speak today. He unfortunately um, uh, has been asked by the Conservative Party to speak on the main stage, uh, which I think is continuing for about 15 minutes longer. I'm hoping that he'll be able to join us for the last 20 minutes of this discussion. But even without him, we have a, an incredibly esteemed, brilliant group of people here to talk through um, this uh, subject. Mm -hmm. So Alex Burkhardt, uh, former colleague of mine actually in, in Downing Street a few years ago, um, but now, uh, this is when your friends go on to great things and you're <laughs> language and running a think tank, but now <laughs> the Minister of Skills in the Department of Education. Um, I will then turn to Bim Akalami, um, who uh, is uh, the PPS Toronto Secretary, I believe, um, uh, also the MP for Hitchin and Hopkinton, um, uh, one of the rising stars in the party by most people's estimation. Uh, I will then turn to Natasha Clark, um, who's political correspondent at the Sun, has been doing all of the Sun's brilliant work uh, around uh, green issues. Um, and finally, I'm going to turn to uh, Bim Kelly um, from uh, National Grid, UK Corporate Affairs Director of National Grid, who I'm incredibly grateful um, for helping us to put on this, this event. And in testament to the subject matter and the importance of this event, uh, it's great to have a stand for it only uh, event or two. Um, so we only have an hour, um, and as I say, we're hoping that, that Ben will join us in about 25 minutes. So we only have an hour, so I'm going to leave my introductions there in the interest of getting into the meat of the discussion, allowing our panelists panelist to um, give their thoughts um, and then opening up to Q&A from all of you, and I'm sure you'll have them. So, without further ado, let me hand over to Alex Burkhardt. Um, thanks very much, Will, and look, thank you to Onward for, for having me. This is the first um, proper panel discussion I've done since I became Minister two and a half weeks ago, although it feels like it's been a lot longer than that, um, because the Department have had me drinking from fire hoses information. Um, but I, uh, I'm, I'm you know, really honoured to be doing this job and I'm, I'm very pleased to be on this panel. I, um, I, as Will said, we work together in the policy unit in number 10 and I, where I, we also work with Neil O'Brien. And you know, Neil and Will are amongst the cleverest people I've ever worked with. And I follow uh, what's happening on with, with a very keen interest uh, ever since. And, and Will's absolutely right. This is, um, yeah, this is one of the, the, the truly massive agendas uh, and I, I, to, to dwell on this for a moment, the, 
uh, the change, the deliberate decision to change uh, the basis of what drives and powers our economy is an enormous decision for, for government to make. It's sort of an enormous decision for, for humankind to make in a way. And I, about 20 or 30 years ago, Richard Dawkins described how he <coughs> thought uh, that carbon-based life would eventually give way to silicon-based life. It's huge sort of paradigm shift that might take place within our lifetimes. And um, yeah, without wanting to make too highfalutin a point, we're seeing a similar thing uh, take place uh, in terms of energy source. That for a very long time, uh, people and society and the economy has depended on carbon-based energy in order to fuel itself. And we have taken uh, the conscious decision to alter that, not because it's cheap to do it, not because it's easy to do it, but because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and this is really a mark of um, a sophisticated, mature, and, and, and highly, highly developed societal thinking. And I, I don't think we should lose sight of that. It's not just a target. It's, it's a change in the way in which we've chosen to do things. And um, you know, what that means is obviously that uh, the, the big departments in, in government, uh, you know, the Treasury, Bays, uh, working with great people in the regions like Ben, are coming up with, uh, with new ways of doing it, of channeling this, uh, this desire for change. And you, know, like, like we, you all know about uh, this huge revolution we've seen of wind power in the UK, about the very exciting developments in carbon capture that are going on the old steel works, um, uh, that uh, you know, the, the way in which we're uh, now uh, trying, we're, we're building these huge um, uh, battery factories that uh, Quasi Quarteng has, uh, has signed off in the north of England. Uh, and we're seeing this, uh, this new economy uh, leap into life uh, because of the result of, of government decisions. Now, uh, where my department comes in, um, uh, where skills come in, is we, we're, we're there to sort of um, you know, grease the axles of this change. Um, that we're there to make sure that uh, as new industries come online, uh, there's a uh, potential workforce available to step in and do those jobs. And there, there are a number of uh, things that, you know, where on before I started the job, but I, I really started to get into the weeds of. Uh, now, I'm, um, now I'm in DFE. Uh, and um, it, obviously, we have our apprenticeship program, um, which uh, we're stacking up a whole series of uh, green initiatives um, uh, under that banner, you know, uh, apprenticeships in ecology, apprenticeships in, in smart fuel technology, uh, apprenticeships in solar power and wind power, um, you know, opportunities for um, people who are young people but also people who want to change their career to get technical know-how in a specific area, working on the job, sometimes while studying, to, um, to become uh, the next generations of workers in very um, specific high-skilled um, high jobs. Before we get to that, though, there's, there's sort of there's a piece that I've, I've long been interested in, which is uh, how you get people uh, ready to how you get people to the point where they're ready to um, uh, to do apprenticeships like that. And uh, yeah, we have still have about 20% of people in their 20s who uh, who lack uh, basic qualifications at level two, sort of GCSE equivalent. Uh, and yeah, a big part, I think, of uh, of my work is going to be um, uh, making sure that that part of society isn't forgotten, that we help them step up so that they can take uh, the, the level three opportunities, uh, the level three uh, lifelong offer that we're, we're putting on the table, uh, that, so they can take advantage of technical apprenticeships. Uh, so the people who are doing technical apprenticeships can um, you know, borrow money from our lifelong um, uh, learning <coughs> entitlement uh, to, uh, to, to do uh, much needed level four and level five skills, um, which uh, will help push forward productivity in the economy. And so that wherever, whoever we look at in um, you know, the workforce chain, we're thinking about how we can help people get on, uh, how we can help people get, uh, get to the next level, uh, and how we can help them get skills in the sectors that are most likely to develop. And this is really one of the, the big things that uh, DfE is trying to do at the moment. We're trying to create a much closer relationship between uh, the desires of uh, the individual for work with the desires and needs of industry and with the capabilities of training providers. And it's tying those um, uh, our ideas together that means that we will have a much more responsive system. 
a system that is capable of um, picking up what skills we're going to need next year, in three years' time, in five years' time, and making sure that those courses are available either in uh, FE or as boot camps or as apprenticeships, um, so that uh, you know, we have an economy that is, uh, is ready and able uh, to generate the skills it needs for the jobs it needs. And, you know, I, to, to end by um, uh, inappropriately uh, misquoting, paraphrasing, uh, um, the um, psychedelic 60s hipster, Timothy Leary. You know, we, we want a generation who will turn on and log in and skill up. <laughs> That's what we're about. <laughs> Fantastic, Alex. Thank you so much. That was a, a brilliant way to begin um, the session. It's really fantastic to see evidence there was such passion and enthusiasm uh, for his new role so early in, uh, in your brief. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, ben, can I turn to you now? <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you, Will. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, I thought I'd just start by saying it's amazing when you look at the fringe meetings of this conference, they tend to be on, on one of two things, either net zero or levelling up, which will tell you what is on the mind of, or the mind of the, the government and the party, and indeed, uh, I think both of those things are very noble uh, objectives, and that's uh, why I'm very happy to come here. So if we're thinking about green jobs and economic recovery, a couple of points. The first point and a friend of mine, Rachel Wolf, at Public First, has done a lot of research on this. Calling things green jobs is not necessarily the winner that lots of people think it is. So, and, and that's partly just from, from a comms perspective, but I think it's important that when we think of jobs, people are ultimately thinking, most people, uh, particularly people who are maybe having to retrain or to switch what they do, they are thinking of their own economic and professional security. And we have to bear that very strongly in mind. We should always remember that preaching to people saying you should switch to this job because it's green, in and of itself is not always a persuader. We have to make sure the professional and economic security is there, which I think it is, if we do this in the right way. And the first thing, uh, the first question I pose myself really is how to ensure re the green transition creates jobs in regions that need it. Now, the regions that need it are not just regions where you may have had deindustrialization de over, say, the last 30, 40 years. They're actually areas where they currently are in quite high carbon intense jobs. They're, you look at, I think, you, you get these stats quite, quite easily. Wales, I think, is the region of the country that has the most carbon intense uh, areas in terms of jobs. And broadly speaking, you go north to south in terms of how intensely carbon uh, oh, how carbon intensive um, the job market is. So if we're now going to net zero, obviously those are the jobs that are, broadly speaking, going to be a threat. The ways in which we ensure this transition, the first of all, is through government direction, law, and spend. And I pick up, I pick up particularly on nuclear power as being absolutely key to this. Uh, now, the government's behind nuclear power, but I think that and we've already approved one large-scale nuclear, um, uh, nuclear power station. I think we need more large-scale nuclear power stations. In Anglesey, they're desperate for one. In Cumbria, they, they want one. There's probably others that I'm unaware of. Let's move those things forward. Let's try and get those on stream as quickly as possible, because getting to uh, an entirely green, as green as we can in terms of our own domestic energy production, isn't just good for the planet, but it's also good for our own energy security uh, as a country. Um, and the second thing is really about skills. Now, the difficulty with skills is everybody talks about it and everybody says the same thing. So, you know, how do you, how do you A, move the dial on skills in a way that's meaningful and persuade people that we can actually improve things? The way in which we really do this is by opening up the new job opportunities. Because when there are new job opportunities with new companies or companies with new sites, you almost get a chance to start from zero. And, and you don't often get that in, in economic policy or in economic transformation. So I think that doing that and doing all the work that the government's been doing on apprenticeships and skills and making sure we get the right, the right skill mix available and providing incentives for companies to put those jobs in certain parts of the country, uh, we can do that using the tax system or planning and various other things. I think that that's what we need to be doing. The skill space needs to change overall, and I'll be slight, slightly controversial because I'm not sure that, that everybody will agree with this, but I think that we see now, depending on who you read, between a quarter, sorry, between sort of, yeah, a fifth and a third, or even perhaps higher, number of graduates after five years do not 
are not in graduate jobs. Uh, and a lot of these young people are stuck with very high amounts of debt, they're frankly disenchanted with the system that they've bought into and they've done all the right things and who can blame them? I think we need to do something quite radical to move more of those people rather than them study those university degrees which are not providing value, and by the way we know what courses they are, there's a lot of data available, is we need to actually, the government shouldn't be funding those courses and we should be much more aggressively funding, using some of that money to fund the FE options, particularly in areas that we're talking about in terms of the green transition. And that's radical, and not everybody will like it, but I think that it could make a huge difference to the availability of skills in the key sectors in quite a short period of time, you know, within the lifetime of this parliament, you start to see people of that, um, people coming through. And the last point, just on how we move people who are already at work into certain jobs, wherever they are in the country, different jobs. And everybody talks about retraining. Now, retraining is incredibly hard to do because if you give people, for example, a government subsidy for, I don't know, 5,000 pounds every to retrain, you end up with a bunch of entrepreneurs setting up retraining sort of companies that will sort of put on courses that are not necessarily supported by the market and then you end up with a whole other set of people who are sort of conned to, to be training to something where they may not always be the, the right skills. So it's a really difficult thing to do um, well, but retraining, I think we need to look at changes in the welfare system to even out people's time when they leave one job before they go to the next one. And if we can even out that, and if they can stay at a higher percentage of income rather than necessarily falling to what they would regard as a much lower income for them to survive with their mortgage and their family life, uh, and there are lots of private sector ways of us doing that, uh, income protection and various other things. If we can even that process out, I think we can make it easier for people to be trained. If they know for a period of months they can be earning, you know, 70, 80% of what they were earning before, whilst they figure out what to do and retrain. I think that sort of change can make a big difference as well. Thank you. Ben, thank you so much. Um, there was a lot in there, but what you were just talking about, which is very similar to the flexible security model that um, exists in various things, maybe it's just, um, uh, really interesting. It starts here. It does, indeed. Um, fantastic. So uh, I'm now going to hand over to Natasha, who, um, well, I'd be interested in your perspective on this today. Um, well, I just thought um, I'd say first, I haven't done a panel before, so please be nice to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I just thought we'd, I wanted to start by just talking about what I think a green job is. Um, and obviously, apart from my job, and apart from being your job, well, thank you, maybe your job, Alex, um, what we mean by this. Um, I think obviously, you know, the, the key sort of when you look at it, I think obviously it's starting to help um, to, to decarbonise. It's jobs that restore nature, it's jobs that improve the environment, obviously, at that very base level. But when we look at this, uh, and like you said earlier, Alex, this is such a huge transformation for the economy. I think that in time, a lot of our jobs will become much more green. Uh, and it won't just be something where you can say, that is a green job, it will be a part of all of our jobs. Uh, and I think that's something that's really important to, to sort of note. Um, it's not just going to be figuring out how to recycle printer cartridges in the office. Um, it obviously that will just be the start uh, of where we're going, the start of this very important journey to, towards net zero. Um, uh, as we've sort of all touched on, there's going to be opportunities. There's also going to be challenges in this uh, to grow the economy in a green way. Um, ben obviously is not here, but a very good article in the Times today uh, about net zero and about how it is no now not just the you know, preferred way to grow the economy, but it is going to be the only way that we will grow the economy in the next 30 to 40 years. Um, and obviously, there are going to be a lot of those green jobs uh, coming down the pipeline. Um, so, the scale is huge, um, the time frame is also very short. Um, uh, yeah, I think what you were saying, Alex, about sort of the incredible nature of the challenge was really important. It's never been something that we've done that I can sort of think of when you look back at recent history that we've, we've made such a choice, we've made such a decision to. to completely radically change our economy in such a fantastic, uh, and, you know, mammoth way, essentially. Um, so it's going to be a challenge, uh, but that does mean opportunity too, so we should not forget that, it, you know, the opportunity for green jobs is, is where we need to focus, and I think that's where the government needs to focus on, they need to be selling this to the British people, and I think that's what a lot of some readers will be very interested to hear uh, from, from ministers and from the government and from Boris uh, in the years to come. Like, years to come, let's be honest, it's happening now, weeks to come, it needs to be happening now. Um, so yes, green homes grant I wanted to talk about as well, um, uh, construction, manufacturing, all of these are opportunities and all of these are things that the government I think needs to be talking about much more. Um, 
you know, even when they've lost, you know, huge chunks of our manufacturing prowess in, 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 in Britain, and I think a lot of people will, you know, happily sort of say, okay, well, those are the areas we, we do need to look at. But it's, it's about more than that. It's not just about manufacturing. It's not just about big sectors. Um, Green Hems Brand, obviously, was, you know, a, a little bit of a flop. I think we can all sort of say that quietly. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a good system. It's a good scheme. It's a good idea. And I'm sure that the um, government will be looking to, you know, put something else in its place. Uh, in the years to come to try and, and make sure that our homes are, are decarbonised. So that's, that's a huge opportunity, not just in the new technology, but in the manufacturing of that. Um, yeah, I, I was, was going to not to speak too much about Teesside, but I think obviously that's, uh, Ben has obviously provided a really good blueprint for, for what the rest of the country can, can look like um, in terms of carbon capture, in terms of what you said, factories earlier. Um, there are lots of these opportunities as we go forward, and I think Ben is providing a really good blueprint for government and should be looking very carefully at what he's doing in Teesside um, for how he's identified those opportunities uh, and for, for, for where the rest of the country can hopefully follow. Um, also, I think it's important that we identify the challenges early in this debate. Um, you know, boilers, everybody in this room, most of you, I imagine 90% of you have a gas boiler. Um, those people, I imagine, are probably not hugely trained in how to put in a heat pump. Um, that's obviously going to be a huge opportunity for the sector, uh, and, uh, and again, the government needs to do far more to sort of get those skills ready. Uh, and it's really great to hear you talk about like, apprenticeships, because I think that's something that the Department for Education has sort of not hugely been been keen on sort of green apprenticeships um, in, in some uh, sectors, and sort of not really been quite sure exactly where they're going with their green apprenticeships. So it's really good to hear that you're all over the green. Uh, and young people, um, you touched on this as well. I think you know government needs to do far more to get to embed. Um, net zero and green in schools. I imagine if we go to micro <coughs> services, any of you have got kids, um, micro services are absolutely dreadful when, when they work to themselves um, exactly what jobs we should be going in and looking at. Um, I think we need to be looking at schools, we need to be looking at colleges, we need to be looking at universities and looking at the courses that they're doing, like you touched on Vim, uh, what are the courses in the future that we need to prepare for the green jobs of the future. Uh, and we need to start that now because we know how long it takes to get there. Net zero is happening really quickly. I know it doesn't seem, 2050 seems like a really long way away, but it's not. We need to be making these decisions now. Uh, we need to be getting these young people ready for those jobs. Um, and yeah, obviously, um, we've also got huge opportunities with COVID. We've got quite a lot of youth unemployment. They've obviously been hit hardest by the pandemic. Um, I know that obviously reskilling isn't, isn't, isn't the answer for everything, uh, but it can be very useful, I think, with, um, with, with young people who are much more adaptable. And I think it's exactly the place where the government can sort of step in uh, with help on this one. Um, yeah, and also I think government has a, has a role to, to play in leading the way as well in this. Um, the recent announcement where um, it's basically saying that only companies that are going towards net zero can, can bid for government contracts. I thought it was a fantastic, uh, you know, signpost to the rest of the country that this is the way it's going. It's a nice little nudge in the right direction. It's not saying you can't do this, it, but it's, it's eventually saying, this is, yeah, this is the way we're going, and I think that's a, a good, good nudge, sort of reward system where it becomes the norm to do this, rather than something where it's a problem to do. Um, yeah, lastly, I just wanted to sort of finish with talking about uh, Rishi and the Treasury. Obviously, we've, we were expecting this net zero view. I'm not sure if anybody knows when it's coming, please do let me know. We've been, we've been waiting for it for a while. Um, but from what we've been hearing from, from people that have been involved in those talks is that the Chancellor is really engaged in net zero and he is on board with it, he does understand the importance of it. Um, but my feelings from sort of watching Green, and I've only sort of been watching the Green Green since about January, so I'm still quite new to this sort of job. Um, but my feelings is that it's just not embedded yet across government. Um, I don't know if you saw the pre-brief for today in Sir Rishi Sunak's speech about jobs, but I, I did read the press release twice. I couldn't find a mention of green jobs. Couldn't find a mention of sort of where that fits in. Uh, hopefully, he will say more in that in his speech later. Um, and I'm sure it's not the case that it's something that he he's not interested in and doesn't care about in any way. But it's just something that I think needs to be more joined up thinking across government. Uh, we obviously don't have a minister directly in charge of green. Uh, it's, it's something that falls across all government departments. Falls across the treasury. Falls across Bays across um, DEFRA. Uh, maybe that's a job for Alok Sharma after he's uh, finished with positive COP26, who knows. Uh, or maybe something for Michael Gove, levelling up, green levelling up, that could be, could be one too. So yes, that's, that's what we've got to say. Thanks Thank for you very much, Natasha. Mm -hmm. No, it's fantastic to have you here, and it's, um, it's really, really valuable having uh, a slightly different perspective. You've been obviously been um, 
focusing on this problem of the kind of benches of the sun and uh, and having that kind of external perspective, uh, looking at government and, and, uh, and kind of viewing the kind of different problems and, and questions that kind of emerge from government around this agenda is, is really, really valuable. Um, so finally, I'm going to turn to Brianna and then <coughs> hopefully Ben will be joining us uh, very shortly. But, um, Great, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, you probably all have heard of National Grid, um, but we operate in the UK and the US and we deliver electricity and gas, and we're trying to do it in the cleanest way possible. In the UK, um, we own and operate the um, electricity and gas transmission networks. We sort of call them the energy uh, superhighways. Um, and we do that in England and Wales, and in just for gas in Scotland, and we have recently bought a local uh, network, WPD. So it gives us a fairly unique position at the heart of um, Britain's energy system. So I thought what I would do is touch on three things. Firstly, a bit of research that we did um, into the scale of the opportunity for the net zero workforce. Then talk a little bit about what I think businesses can do to support young people um, get into the net zero workforce. And then finally, um, a little bit about the um, Green Jobs Task Force, which I sat on and had a report that came out earlier in the year. So we um, did some research at the start of 2020 and produced a report called Building the Net Zero Energy Workforce. And what we found is that we're going to need something like 400,000 jobs in the energy sector by 2050, and about 120,000 of those out to 2030 if we're going to meet our net zero targets. And the good news is that those jobs are spread right across the economy. Um, so in a way, present a really significant opportunity for us to um, get into the regional inequalities that exist across uh, the economy. So for example, um, for offshore wind um, and workforce attrition, we think in the northwest will mean about 60,000 jobs. And then in the northeast, Yorkshire and Humber, we'll probably need to recruit something like 40,000 jobs to deliver offshore wind, carbon capture and storage, and pro like projects like the East Coast Cluster, which we're a partner in, and helping to support decarbonisation of that region. And then with the continued growth in offshore and onshore wind power, we'll need to probably drive about 60,000 jobs in Scotland by 2050. So hopefully they give you a sense of the um, opportunity uh, from net zero and green jobs. But one of the key issues I think, particularly in the energy sector, is the need to address diversity. If we don't fill these roles and meet our, we won't meet our climate change targets, and what we're gonna to need to have to do is um, attract people who probably haven't typically thought of the energy sector as somewhere they want to go. We need to have a much more diverse perspective, bring people in from all walks of life to make sure that we're able to fill those roles, but also bring in the innovation and new ideas that we'll need to deliver net zero. And to do this, I think there's a pretty important role um, for responsible and purpose-led organizations like National Grid. So let me just touch a little bit on that. Um, in the autumn of last year, we published a responsible business charter, which is our articulation of what we think responsible business means at National Grid. And within the charter, we committed to developing skills for the future, with a focus on lower income communities. And we want to provide access to skills development for 45,000 people by 2030, and achieve 500,000 volunteering hours also by 2030. And so to do this, we have established Grid for Good, um, which is an energy industry community program led by us, and it's to support socioeconomically disadvantaged young people ages 16 to 25. The program's been running virtually, and Alex, to your point, it is very much about getting people ready for work. It includes a 12-week career mentoring program, two weeks work experience, access to our apprenticeships and internships, work readiness training, networking, and industry taster sessions. And so far, we've had about 2,000 people through the scheme. It's also, in addition to the normal apprenticeships and graduate program that, you, that you'd expect a business like National Grid to run. The reason I mention that is I think there's a really important role for the business community in pulling through green jobs, in providing the skills, in providing the retraining, in reskilling our workforce to make sure that we're set to deliver the net zero targets. Um, and one of the things I want to touch on finally is the uh, government's green job task force, so a partnership between business between trade unions, the education sector, campaign groups. And we were tasked to come together, I think November of last year, we produced a report in July, to make recommendations to the government. And one of the things that was so noticeable about the task force was just how much consensus there was between all the people around the table. 
Um, and we produced a final report in July and uh, we set out a range of recommendations, but based on three themes. One, the, the need to pull through net zero investment. Secondly, creating green job career pathways that are accessible to everybody. And then finally, ensuring that it's a just transition. So making sure that those in carbon intensive sectors today are able to transition and reskill for the new net zero jobs that will come along. And I think the recommendations are pretty helpful in making sure that we have the right people in the right place at the right time to achieve our climate change goals. But the truth is it's not gonna happen overnight. And we probably do need to see some action from government on, some, on all the recommendations uh, if we're going to move from intent away from ambition to intent and delivery at pace. But this is probably particularly important with the hotly anticipated net zero strategy that we're hoping will come out by um, COP26. And also we need decisions from the business community around business models and from technologies like carbon capture usage and storage, storage so that we're able in the business community to make the right investments to pull through the green jobs that we've been talking about today. So that's really all I wanted to say. Um, but hopefully we'll have a great conversation looking forward to all the questions. Thank you so much, Rihanna. Thank you to all of our panellists for, um, for introducing this session so brilliantly. We've covered an enormous amount of ground already. We've talked about uh, green uh, skills and education in schools, uh, through career services, right through to uh, apprenticeships, uh, transitioning. Uh, graduates are currently not perhaps in uh, that economically um, valuable uh, kind of courses um, into more uh, economically valuable and green um, uh, technical education, right through into retraining in, in, in later life. We kind of looked at the whole life cycle um, of <coughs> getting people ready and employing people within the green economy. Um, I'm now going to open up uh, to the floor for questions. Um, I will take more than one question at a time, um, uh, so probably take two or three questions and then pose them to our panel. Um, so if anyone would like to start the questions, that would be fantastic. There's a gentleman at the back and then a gentleman um, two rows in front, and then I'll come to this question too. So the gentleman at the back first. Uh, let's Hi, um, sorry, I don't know if the mic or if you can hear me or not. Or you, you can speak, 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 speak loudly and uh, introduce I, I, yourself. I, I can try and speak louder and clearer, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate um, Alex um, and say I, I am an apprenticeship holder. Um, I completed an apprenticeship about five years ago and it really is what launched me into the world of work. So, you know, thank you to the government for having uh, introduced those. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from the Woodland Trust that I work for nowadays, um, and one of the ideas that we've been looking at to uh, solve a multi-pronged crisis that we face in skill shortage in arboriculture and horticulture skills, um, but also a uh, capacity shortage when it comes to um, UK sourced trees and woods, which addresses a biosecurity uh, issue, which uh, Bim kind of touched on the security. Um, one of the ideas we've been looking at is uh, the rollout of um, kind of regional or local authority uh, nurseries to try and provide a route into the arboricultural, horticultural world for uh, young people as a new career option while providing the kind of capacity for help meet the government's ambitious farming target and green up the economy. Um, and I just wonder um, what more, um, you know, link up there could be between DFE and uh, DEFRA perhaps to help bring these ideas uh, more in, and also with, should say, with Delac, the new department, uh, to help bring these ideas more to level up uh, in these uh, areas where you know there is land available for this, often in the most deprived uh, communities, uh, and where these skills can provide a valuable new um, source of employment for many people. Thank you very much. I'll never get used to these new acronyms, Delac. <laughs> Someone described it as de lush the other day. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much. So the second question, uh, to Rosie. Hi, I'm uh, James Cox from Bristol Airport. Um, I was wondering, um, it was really good to hear about further education, because we don't hear about that enough. And I was wondering what the panel thought uh, we could do more to link employers and further education together. It's a big challenge in, in my world of aerospace, for example. Thank you very much, Jason. Hi, uh, my name is Annabelle Smith. I work at a think tank called Centre for Progressive Policy, and I lead a network called the Inclusive Growth Network, which is a network of 12 local and combined authorities across the UK. Um, and you know, the, the our kind of political leaders in the network are particularly concerned about how do we enable a just transition at the local and regional level. 
um, many of the places have a very strong cultural memory of deindustrialization and the impacts on their community. Um, so I wonder, in particular, what do you think the role of local and regional leadership is, particularly delivering a just transition? What are the tools that local and regional leaders need? And do you think that local and regional leaders are equipped with the tools that they need to deliver that? Thank you very much. Uh, great to see you there as well. Big fan of work from CBT. Um, so, uh, can I, um, I'm going to just come down our panel from right to left, and that's right. And, um, if there are particular questions that people want to major on within that, then please feel free. So, Alex, if I could. Um, sure, I'll try and touch on all three of those questions because they're all interesting. And the uh, gentleman back from uh, Woodland Trust. And what, um, I, 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 funnily enough, I, I saw an initiative not dissimilar to the one, uh, the sort of thing you're talking about the other day um, in my constituency, which is in, in Essex. Um, um, uh, the, uh, as part of the, the offset from uh, the new Thames Crossing, there's a plan to, to grow a new forest, uh, which is fantastic for me because the Thames Crossing isn't in my constituency, but the new forest will be. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, yes, but, but part of uh, that initiative will involve uh, young people who are doing our apprenticeship in, um, I'm going to use the wrong term, uh, in, 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 in the apprenticeship. Uh, are arborists, um, uh, environmentalists, and so on. So uh, we're already seeing that sort of initiative, but not as you suggest through local authorities and regions. And if there's any local authority or region that you're already working with where you, you think there's potential, do let me know. A uh, gentleman from uh, Bristol Airport. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, and this, this sort of ties in uh, similarly to, uh, to what the, the lady from the Centre for Progressive Policy um, uh, said as well. I, one of the, the major reforms that's underway in uh, DFE is um, you know, part of the skills bill is that we are setting up um, uh, uh, local skills improvement plans um, and what these will do you know, uh, held locally um, these will uh, try and take account of what skills are needed for growth in the local area uh, and then use that information to inform uh, FE colleges and adult education providers to uh, help make sure that they're providing the courses that young people not so young people might need to go into the job market. So yeah, as, I, as I said in my um, opening remarks, yeah, having that responsive system where uh, local employers know who to go to in the local community to say, this is what we think we're gonna need. Uh, and having a place where that information and that thinking is held so it can be disseminate, disseminated to um, local centers of learning is, is absolutely crucial to what we want to achieve. Thank you very much, Alex. Natasha. Um. I just wanted to talk about Annabelle's point about, about local um, just transition. Um, it would be great if the government could come up with a, a national plan and then maybe we could talk about the regions, that would be fab. Um, but in terms of local leadership, I think Andy Street has been really keen to, to and he's you know, been very open with the government that he wants more local controls in order to you know, make sure that he basically says, you know, I can do it best because I know my area best and I know the jobs, I know the areas, I know the industry, I know the businesses. Uh, you know, he essentially is like, give me more powers. Obviously, I'm sure every regional mayor wants more powers, of course, but he's, you know, makes a very good, compelling argument for why that should be. Um, I, can, I can totally see uh, his point, to be honest. Um, I also wanted to sort of come back on your point from, about Brazil University and uh, sort of how we can um, um, essentially link up further education with um, with the industry. And I think, uh, as someone that was sadly not at university too long ago, I think the key to doing that is doing it within the classroom itself. Uh, I think that what people want to see when they're studying a course is <coughs> the sort of jobs that they can get into. I think when you're at university, you actually have no idea what jobs are out there in the real world uh, until someone comes into the classroom and tells you. Uh, so I think a key to that, um, and key for me when I was sort of trained to be a journalist, was having journalists come in and tell us all about their careers and all about the sort of things that you actually can do. Uh, and I think those links with universities are crucial. Not just the, you know, I'm sure it's very easy to to to, to you know set up a jobs fair, uh, a freshers fair, and you know send your best recruiters in and go, you know, this is why you should want to come and work with me. Um, but I think you know that sort of tends to attract probably a very small slither of students. I think working uh, with them. Uh, obviously, um, you know, university in terms of airports, sort of jobs, aerospace engineering, those sort of jobs, 
uh, are probably more practical degrees anyway, so I'm sure you're already doing that. I'm sure you don't need me to say. But I think having those people in the classroom coming in and talking and working together, um, you know, providing that sort of leadership and showing exactly what sort of jobs that they are uh, and what they can be skilling up and training up to do will be really helpful in the future. Thank you very much, Natasha. It's probably worth also saying that um, Andy Sreen, you mentioned, uh, actually has explicitly made a push for adult education responsibility in the Westminster that's precisely so we can link up green jobs with uh, green industry into this patch. And so the, the two questions are actually quite closely linked to that regard. Ben. Yeah, I mean, uh, Woodland Trust, to I know well, uh, more local nurseries, please. Yes, I know that Zach Goldsmith's very keen on this. There are other people that are very keen on it. I think we just need to keep banging the drum on that. I think it can have huge benefits, uh, particularly for those who don't know about sort of the importance of nurseries. It's not just like a nice word, a nice thing to have. What it does is it doesn't just give the skills that you've already described, but also it reduces the carbon miles you need because significant amounts of uh, trees or various plants that we plant in this country actually come from Holland, and they've come from somewhere else to Holland, and then they get flown to the UK. So for us to actually have our own uh, domestic uh, nurseries has a significant carbon, positive carbon impact. Um, on the just transition, the, the key, Let's just be very frank about this. The key point here is really about local government capacity and about the willingness of local central government to relinquish control. That is the point. Natasha's uh, remark where she said that you know you need a national plan and underneath that you need you can then do a local plan is absolutely correct. So that's what we first need to see. And to be honest, the national plan is you know is, is very imminent. But actually, local areas need more money. And therefore, that helps build the capacity. How do they get more money? I don't think there's, it's, it's sustainable to continually, you know, the central government doling out more cash to local authorities because, frankly, there isn't going to be enough of it. What we need is to raise more money locally in order to build those, that capacity locally in order to do the things we want to do. How do we raise more money locally? Of course, there are a huge range of taxes you can look at. If we're talking about the environmental area, I think we should be brave and say, there are some taxes that are, that are punishing, in inverted commas, carbon intensive behavior in order to incentivize move to low carbon. Things like the landfill tax, for example, let's double it. And let's give that extra amount to local authorities. And if we did that, we would incentivize movements away from, you know, incentivize positive recycling behaviors at local authorities and from individuals and we'd raise money for local authorities to do these sort of things. Now, landfill tax is just one tax, there'll be others, but let's think of local authorities mm. raising more money locally in the areas of the environment, because if we can do that, then people will directly see that sort of link, and the local authorities will benefit from when they are effective locally. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I've only got a couple of extra points, but I do agree that um, delivery going to be best for a lot of net zero at local level and that's particularly true when it comes to decarbonising our building stock and homes and I think that local authorities and governments are the best place to be able to do that so we need to enable that and I think it should be underpinned by a national plan and you get delivery at, at local level. On the point about employers and education, um, I agree with what Natasha said about um, coming into classrooms. I was going to extend that slightly. I think it's all the way through the education system and I think the truth is anybody who works in and around or has a view or can talk about net zero it ought to be going into any classroom. I don't think it's just university students, I think, <coughs> it's, I think everybody should, should be, should should be, be the, well I, I'm, and I, I've actually been going in because I feel that kids need to see what it looks like and what it feels like, they need to be inspired now rather than waiting till they get to university. Um, and then I've got a lovely example, so um, I actually got an email yesterday from somebody at National Grid who'd been to the <coughs> college talked to local college about their um, uh, course and we drafted it for them so it had more net zero in it and the local college thought it was so good they'd embed it in. So it comes back to that point about we need to get our employees in all of our businesses out and about into our communities, into our schools and our education system to sell uh, jobs in the net zero workforce. Absolutely. Um, fantastic. Um, so do we have any more questions? So we have, oh, we have lots of questions. Um, I will try and get all of you in. I'm going to take uh, the gentleman standing up and then the woman immediately behind him. 
Um, and then I'm going to take the women in the second row, but I think just have hand up for a while, and then I'll try and come back for another round. So if people can be quick, and I might be quite direct with them, um, who asks us what. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, does the panel think that it's time that we stopped treating uh, apprenticeships and uh, vocational routes into uh, education for the second best? Um, and because every time I hear it, it's university mm. first and apprenticeships second. And you know, there's, a, there's a hybrid there with high level degree apprenticeships, which is something we should be definitely pushing. But do we think we should get the, get the order sorted out? Because vocational in, work routes into employment are the answer to a lot of the solutions and lots of problems that we've discussed today. Thank you. Uh, immediately behind, Robin Red. Um, yes, um, I'm uh, Sarah Winston from the Energy Efficiency Infrastructure Group. Um, obviously, our homes are really crucial um, to, to green jobs. Uh, government policy has decimated our industry. Um, I specifically work on the insulation and side, and the Green Homes Grant, we, we actually lost a thousand jobs um, from piecemeal government policy throwing money at us, the boom and bust cycles. This has to stop. Basically, we need certainty for the industry to plan, upskill. Through our better, uh, better Buildings Investment Plan, we have basically 190,000 jobs in the pipeline up to 2030. However, government does not commit to long-term plans, which is what these businesses need. How does the panel think that we can actually achieve that cross departmental, treasury, housing department, base working together? Because we can't cut through it. Thank you very much. And there's one in black, second row. Um, is the government doing enough to harness the potential of nature-based solutions like hedgerow planting? Um, CPRE Research, the organisation I'm from, um, we've commissioned research that shows that 40% more hedgerows by 2050 could deliver as much as 25,000 new jobs, as well as, in, as well as reducing carbon emissions and boosting nature. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna um, ask people to answer specific questions. Um, if they want to answer other questions, they can do But Alex, could you, uh, you might want to respond directly to the gentleman about his concerns about second person. Well, look, I'm, I'm the new Minister for Skills, so uh, you know, I, you'll probably guess what I can say. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, uh, what, what occupies uh, most of my time are those other routes, and I certainly don't see them uh, as second best. Uh, every, every person in this country, every young person in this country, um, you know, we want to help them find the job that's right for them. Some people that will be through a university path, and some people it will be through a vocational path. Yeah. But I'd also say this, that, that the distinction between the university degree and the vocational route is, is in many respects a false one. And that, you know, if somebody's studying medicine at university, they are on a vocational path, um, you know, and they're, they're doing a university degree. We have degree level apprenticeships now, yeah. uh, and we have, have some fantastic uh, vocational courses being provided by HE providers, some fantastic vocational courses being provided outside of HE altogether. But I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. You know, we, we shouldn't let young people think that the only way to a decent job is through a university degree. Yeah. There you go. That's the reassurance. Um, uh, I've just heard, I'm afraid, that Ben Hush has been waylaid in security uh, at uh, security, <laughs> indeed. So he's <laughs> preventing him from getting to this event. Uh, I apologise um, uh, that he's not able to be with us, but it leaves a little bit more about time for questions, so, um, so hopefully we won't be too disappointed. Ben, can I come to you on the... Um, Question of the background uh, long-termism in government and how providing that certainty in business. Yes, long-termism, or rather the lack thereof, can be a problem. But the bigger problem mm. in this sector, I, I don't actually think is the government lack of long-term thinking. In fact, the government's put out a lot of long-term mm. targets, long-term thinking. The issue is the way in which we choose to implement it. And the Green Homes Grant is a very good example of how when you over-specify and you over-regulate in terms of the little ways in which you have to, all these little loopholes you're trying to get through in order to achieve 15 things with a comparatively small amount of money, that's when you get bad outcomes. What we need to be doing is taking our actual long-term vision on the environment, which is pretty clear and has been and is in a wide variety of ways, but then having very simple government policies that are clear, easy to manage, easy to understand, that then businesses can invest on. If you have a long-term plan, then you have 50,000 little different schemes with little different pots of money. That in and of itself is going to create problems. So I think that's what we need to do. And just to this gentleman, because I was very taken by his point around apprenticeships, a lot of companies now 
unbeknownst to lots of people in politics, mm. companies are already ahead of where politicians are. You know, accountancy firms. Now, accountancy is a typical vocational thing, right? They used to never need to go to university if you want to become an accountant. You did your three years, you did your exams, and you became an accountant. They're almost now returning back to that. And whenever I speak to partners at PwC, KPMG, or whatever, they are all telling me about how many more people each year they are taking on the apprenticeship route, and how they're thinking, oh my goodness, you know, why, why have we waited so long to do this? So actually, I think that companies are actually already making this transition faster than the sort of political classes. Thank you very much. Really I'm just going to come in. One of the things we discussed, discussed on the Green Jobs Task Force was actually getting everybody else to believe that apprenticeships are not the poor cousin. Yeah. And that includes teachers, it includes people at home, it includes guardians, because of the risk is that even if you say it in the classroom, you go home and someone poo poos it. So I think that it, this part of it is just reframing the importance of apprenticeship so that everybody thinks it's something for them. Thank you. Natasha, can I ask you to come, come in on the third question around nature based solutions? How much does, mm -hmm. does the sun care about hedgerows? <laughs> I wish we cared about hedgerows more, um, to be quite honest with you. And thanks very much for having us here event a couple of weeks ago in Parliament great um, and very well attended by politicians who are very keen on some of the recommendations in your report, uh, especially that, yeah, it's job creating, economy boosting, really easy, simple solutions that I think, yeah, policymakers definitely need to get on board with. Um, yes, it's sadly, um, hetero is probably not quite the, the sexy subject <laughs> in the sun, but yes, no, absolutely, I think, yeah, government definitely absolutely need to get on board. Uh, and to be fair, it uh, is one of Boris Johnson's four things, cop, coal, cash, trees, cars. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, great. Sounds about right. <laughs> um, but yes, trees. Um, obviously, you know, we all love watching the green carpet trees, so um, you know, I think that's definitely some of the politicians I'm sure can get more on board with nature institutions and they should definitely become. Fantastic, thank you. We I think had two or three uh, more questions that uh, we have uh, several or eight minutes to get into. So there was the woman who's been waiting patiently at the front, uh, there was the gentleman behind her, um, and then there was the gentleman at back, who I'm going to take, I didn't see your hand up earlier, sir, so I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to cut you off, but um, if I can come to you first, to the front. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, sorry, I'll just wait for a moment. Okay. Uh, um, I'm Susie, I'm the leader of Mid-Suffolk District Council. Um, in Suffolk, we have huge potential. We've got the energy coast of the coast of Suffolk. We've just been awarded Freeport East in Suffolk. We've almost got size, a new size wall, and we're the birthplace of fibre. So we have huge potential, but we have an ageing population. We have the highest rate of over 80s in the UK. Low wage, and as a council, we are trying to um, facilitate, for want of a better word, uh, apprenticeships, career choices, reskilling, retraining. <coughs> but our opposition, who are mainly Greens, don't want any new buildings, they don't want even buildings nuclear. How do we, for our, our residents who perceive they want all this stuff, but they shouldn't have to pay for it through their council tax, how do we juggle that bit when we as a council are uh, perceived to be only responsible for d picking up the bins and approving planning applications? There's a real um, dichotomy there of how we, how we fund it. And we are making our own plans because government haven't given us any. Okay. Gentlemen here. Yeah, I'm Daniel Ellis from the ICNW. I wanted to pick up on the point that Tasha made, which is that, uh, I don't want to say it's a rock, 30 odd million people in employment in the UK. They're not all going to be in green industries as we describe them, but we need them all contributing to the delivery of net zero or it won't work. So we need to be talking about skills and support for a green economy. With that regard, thinking about business models, what support needs to be given to SMEs to transform their business models? Because you know, if you're a small business with a handful of employees, you do not have the money to hire an specialist sustainability advisor. Thank you very much. And the you were so gentleman back here. Uh, hi, I'm Shane. I'm the um, editor at Every Week, which is the sector newspaper in the federal education sector. And um, my question, unsurprisingly, might be more directed towards Alex than anybody else, but. Um, Alex, your predecessors in the department were fairly reluctant to, seemed fairly reluctant to use the levers at their disposal to direct certain initiatives in, in particular ways towards particular priorities. So just to mention the apprenticeship levy, for instance, uh, your predecessors were very firm that the government introduced the apprenticeship levy but didn't want to really stipulate any priorities underneath which that money should be spent towards any particular priorities, i.e. net zero. 
Uh, do you feel that in the new administration with yourself, Michelle and uh, Nadine, uh, you might be more willing to use some of the sort of pre-existing leaders at your disposal to direct what could be quite a significant resource towards training and apprenticeships in the school and net zero sectors? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to perhaps come to Alex first if you just want to address that question from Becky Reid. Right. Sure. Well, uh, Shane, um, I, I, I don't want to uh, disappoint you early on in um, uh, my, my tenure um, or, or in this session. Um, but I, let, let me just reiterate what, um, what I've, I've said in my, my opening remarks, which is that what we're trying to do is build a system, a, a whole system that is much more responsive to what local business needs. And so thinking about, not, and not just local business, you know, the, the national economy as well. Um, how is it that we can make sure that uh, training providers of whatever um, uh, uh, color and whatever stage are um, offering uh, young people and older learners um, the skills that, that local industry and national industry is going to need. So you know, that's really where my uh, priorities are focused and then you know, there'll be um, plenty of initiatives to hang on that. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, Bim, do you want to come in on this question, just building on what Natasha said, the gentleman from the ICAW, in terms of how we can get businesses and uh, okay, ordinary employers to be focusing much more on green, uh, on green issues as part of their day jobs, rather than uh, especially not, not just kind of expecting SMEs to be hiring in a sustainability advisor or whatever to help. Yeah. Um, look, it'd be perfect if everybody just thought about this every day and this is what they did. The truth is, people who run businesses, this is not what people think about. They are thinking about getting their business through the day, the week, the month, the year. And we should always remember, and I go back to what I was saying at the beginning, that economically and financially, this has to work for individuals and for businesses. Having said that, the way in which you embed lower carbon behaviors and outcomes is through, first of all, elite queues, so the biggest businesses, the ones that have the time and space to do this sort of thing, they should be working first, and they can start doing it. They can then work with their own supply chains to help them get to certain places. Government procurement, as we've heard, can also do things. So you start up there, uh, and then what you really try and do with technology and tax incentives and, uh, and all the new technologies is you try and make affordable and cheap lower carbon ways of doing things. Everything from the energy you use in the office to the light bulbs you use to the paper that you use in the printer to all of these things to whether people work from home one day a week or you make them come in every day or whatever it is. That's really how you do it. I don't think it's sustainable to turn around and say, look, you know, every SME business, you know, you've got to be thinking about the environment. They're already completely weighed over by like regulation and trying to trying to get through the year as it is. And I think that the best way is to make it easier for them to go green. Thank you very much. Um, and Rianne and Natasha, could I perhaps bring you each in in turn on um, this question of how we pay for it? So this question, the first question from the gentleman, the gentleman, uh, so the woman from the front um, uh, about, uh, from in Suffolk about uh, actually how to, you know, how to pay for it and how local authorities and different bits of government should think about how to pay for it. Um, Natasha, perhaps in job question isn't it how do we pay for it um yeah it depends what we're, we're talking about exactly what we're paying for um i think until we see what what the government's national plan is for net zero um then i don't think it's sort of feasible to sort of be thinking too much too much detail about exactly mm. how that is very interesting idea from you been about sort of the local levies and it sounds like if there were to be a national plan then we get the local plan then you focus more on exactly how we can you know look at things like council tax or, or whatever it might be to, to sort of fund that. I think you're completely right that um, you know local authorities can't continue with the, the sort of low levels of funding that they've got. I mean having uh, you know national government just pump money in is just not a sustainable way. Um, and, and the point that Colin Brooklyn was earlier made about sort of that long term thinking, you know, we need to be planning for the next fifteen years and starting to think and work backwards about how, how we you know we start at net zero and work backwards to how we get there. Um, you know, for some readers, I think that's you know the price of net zero is something that's really, really important. They really don't want to be whacked in the wallets because you know what they see is you know some green stuff that they don't really understand yet. And I don't think politicians are really doing a good enough job in explaining exactly what net zero is and, and how we get there. So I do think that that's really laying the groundwork for that needs to happen first before we even talk about 
uh, paying for it, um, but you know the poorest shouldn't really be paying and, and hitting the wallets for all this policy. Uh, it's something that was, you know, obviously something that has to happen. I don't think anybody, you know, is going to argue with that climate science anymore. Um, but it's something that I think government needs to think very seriously to try and protect those on the lowest incomes from the biggest cost of this. Thank you, Natasha. Ria. Yeah, it's a really difficult question, so I'm not sure I've got a really good answer, um, but I'll give it a go. One thought is, um, I think the challenge so far has been that much of at least energy policy, the cost of that have gone on to energy bills. And I think as we transition into the, uh, as we move away, as we move into a world where we're going to need to think more about decarbonisation of the building stock on our homes, I'm not sure that's very viable. I'm not sure those costs can continue to go on the bills. So it might be that we need to think more broadly about where do we where do we lay those costs and could it be on taxpayers. Um, your other question is maybe the location of Suffolk um, maybe think through some of the challenge of this is that it's national benefit and sometimes local impact. And how do we square that? Um, so and, and how do we sell the benefit? So we we've got a lot of work coming up uh, along the east coast to put in new transmission lines to bring in the offshore wind. Nobody wants a new transition transmission line, but the country needs it. If we don't have it, we can't bring the electricity from offshore wind in. So, in that, what, what, where do we, where's the sweet spot in the middle where there's 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 new transmission lines, there's benefit to local communities, but the cost doesn't fall on everybody. And I think that's one for us. That's one of the big conundrums that we're still working through. So it'd be good to have a further conversation with you. Fantastic. Well, um, on that on that happy note and very productive note, um, I'm delighted to bring uh, this session to a close. Uh, we're right on time, um, and I'm not going to try and sum up everything because we've, we've covered an enormous amount of ground. But I'm I'm so grateful uh, to our panelists for being so open and thoughtful in their remarks um, and to giving us a huge amount of meat to get into. Actually, I mean, this feels like this debate has already been going on for some time, but actually, we've got a hell of a long way to go if we're going to get anywhere near like uh, the, the level of ambition um, that the country has. Uh, and rightly so. So thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you in particular to Nathan for supporting um, this event and allowing us to put on such a brilliant uh, panel. Uh, and if you could all just join me in putting hands together and giving our panel a round of applause.